Good morning, Gateway. So good to see you here this morning. You know, every Sunday morning, God votes in favor of you being in church. And the devil votes in favor of you skipping church. And then you have the tie-breaking vote. So here we are this morning, and as Barb mentioned, we're picking up where we left off last week. We started a new series of, of teachings based on Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, there was one family that were on their way home from church one Sunday morning. Mom and dad are up front, and the kids are in the back. And the dad said, so what did you kids learn in Sunday school this morning? And, and their son spoke up, and he said, oh, we learned the story about the Good Smart American. <laughs> so before we <laughs> revisit that parable this morning... Would you boldly repeat after me, I love God, therefore I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow His example. Say, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. You say amen. All right, then uh, let's turn again this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. And this is where we find a lawyer who approaches Jesus one day. And and he said, teacher, what do I have to do in order to qualify for eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what what does the Scripture say? What, what, What was God's Word on the matter? And they determined that God's Word says, well, you have to love God. And love your neighbor. But, but then it says this lawyer, he wanted to justify himself. And, and so he pressed the matter a little bit further. He said, well, what do you mean by neighbor, Jesus? And that's when Jesus used this parable to answer the question, who are the people in your neighborhood? And so we pick it up in verse 30 of Luke chapter 10. Jesus replied to this lawyer, by saying, well, there was a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is approximately 25 kilometers. So he's on foot. He's he's not driving a vehicle. He's walking. It's dangerous territory. So here's what happened. He's on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho when he's attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Well, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man... He passed by on the other side. Couldn't be bothered to stop and help. Verse 32. So also a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Don't look at me. I'm not getting involved, he said. And he continued right on his way. But verse 33 says, A Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine in the wounds. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses that may may have been involved here in looking after this guy. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers, Jesus asked. Well, the expert in the law replied, well, of course, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and be a good, smart Canadian. (laughs) Now, as most of you know, this series that we're teaching during these four weeks It's called, Who Are the People in Your Neighborhood? In other words, who are the people within your reach of helping, of showing friendliness, showing loving kindness toward them? You see, this is all about being intentional, about being missional. And I was explaining last week, to be missional, that means that our mission is to have an impact on others around us, right? To help people in Jesus' name, to influence as many as we can for the kingdom. Somebody say amen. Amen. You see, when you have Jesus, you want to share Jesus, right? Don't hoard Jesus. (laughs) Share Him freely with others. Think of it this way. When you use your candle to light the candles of 
others, you don't have anything to lose. But the others have much to gain from the exchange, right? So folks, our mission is to reach out to people. As I, I said last Sunday, we're looking at four levels of neighborliness in this series. So last week we looked at level one, which was the practical level of kindness. We see that in verse 34. I mean, it can't get much more practical than medicine, bandages, then there was the donkey, the transportation, the hotel, the arrangements with the innkeeper. The guy took money out of his own pocket, two denarii. They tell us that would be the equivalent of two days' wages. By today's standards, probably three or four hundred bucks. Gave it to the innkeeper said, hey, look after this guy. So this American, I mean, this Samaritan offered practical assistance, right? Folks, it is fun to be spontaneously offering help to people who have a need. Come on, that's your cue to say amen. Oh, it's so good to just reach out in ways small and, 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 and great to help people along the way. One lady, she was pulled over on the side of the road. It was a Sunday morning. She's got a flat tire, a couple of kids in the car. And she's standing out there on the road looking kind of distressed. And, and along comes this guy, and, and he sees the situation, and he pulls over in front of her, and he says, wow, you got a flat tire. Do you have a spare? She said, yes, I do. I'm not exactly sure how to put it on. He said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So he gets out the spare tire and takes off the flat tire and, and uh, he, he gets, he gets the, the, the thing done and, and she's good to go and she's so thankful and, and she couldn't help but notice the guy's wearing a suit and tie in all of this. And she said, thank you so much for your kindness. I sure hope that I haven't made you late for church. He said, ah, don't worry about it. They won't start without me. I'm the pastor. So she thanked him again, and they got in their cars. And then she noticed as he pulled away that the bumper sticker on the back of his car said, Follow me to Glen Forest Baptist Church. <laughs> I'd like to think she did. <laughs> so always be on the lookout for those opportunities to be a good Samaritan on a practical level. Practical is good. But how many of you know we can do better? Come on, this morning... Let's all aspire to move to the next level, which is reaching out to people on a personal level. Everybody say personal. Yeah, very often the personal level is an emotional level. Notice in verse 33. When they, this, this Samaritan that came along, when he saw this guy that was in bad shape there on the roadside, it says when he saw him, he took pity on him. Everybody say compassion. Is that not a great Bible word? Compassion. See, compassion, if we could use this definition, it's an emotional response to a person who is hurting. Spirit, soul, or body, or all of the above. Yeah, compassion is an emotional response to somebody that's hurting bad. Folks, I don't want to read something into this story that's not accurate, but I can't help but believe that from the time this Samaritan found Buddy in, in, the, in, the, in the blood and in the mud of the ditch, and he helped him to the end, from the time that he found him to the time the following day when, when he continued on his way and, and left the guy in the care of the innkeeper. So what might that have been, 12, 24 hours, somewhere in that in that range, I'm thinking that during those hours that these two men were becoming acquainted with each other and acquainted with this distressing situation, there had to be considerable conversation between the two of them. You know, as this Samaritan is, is offering some very real care to this stranger, I'm convinced that they, they, they were talking to each other. And it wasn't just on a practical level. You need another Tylenol? <laughs> it wasn't just small talk. Did you see that game last week, that soccer game between Jerusalem and Jericho? What a game. <laughs> oh, no. No, I, I, I think there's no doubt that the exchange between these two men was quite personal. 
It was quite emotional. You, under, you understand, this man was hurting inside and out. He suffered a terrible injustice. Come on, it was an act of violence. Not only did he feel violated, he'd been robbed. He'd been humiliated. The Bible says these bandits, they stole his clothes. He's laying there pretty much naked. It's just an awful experience, physically and emotionally. What kind of emotion must there have been expressed between these two men? Anger toward the thugs? You know those thieves who did this? Misgivings toward the priest and the Levite? I mean, for crying out loud, these guys are officers of the church. And they couldn't stop to help? Man, if you can't get a Christian to reach out, who can you get? And where was God when all of this was going on? Why did God let this happen to me? I've been a good Jew all my life. What was, that? was that the emotion that came to the surface? Or I don't know, maybe, maybe this guy that had been beaten up had a really positive attitude. Yeah, maybe he said, I'm just so happy to be alive. Thank you so much for, for helping me. I forgive those guys who did this to me. I forgive those guys from the temple. I'm just so happy to be alive. Maybe that was the emotion, but nevertheless, it was on an emotional level. All the while, this kind Samaritan is trying to speak peace into this guy's trauma. You're going to be okay, my friend. I just know you're going to be okay. Dear, listen, do you have a wife and children in Jericho that are going to be worried about you? That, that, that maybe as I continue on my way, maybe I could search them out in Jericho and let them know that there's been an incident and you've been delayed, but you're going to be all right. Do, is there family or friends that I need to get in touch with? You understand, that's, that's sharing and going the extra mile on a very personal level. Folks, can you see in this parable that the Samaritan, he's not just an agent of practicality. He was also a man of sensitivity, of mercy, of comfort, of pity, as it says in the NIV. The point is, when somebody is hurting and you are aware of their problem and you care about their feelings, that's when you have the opportunity to reach out on a personal slash emotional level. If we want to. Folks, how many of you ever found yourself in the situation that somebody spilled their guts to you? (laughs) You ever been there? You know, somebody just needs a listening ear. They need a sympathetic heart. They need, you know, a shoulder to cry on. Could be a co-worker. Could be a fellow student. Could be a relative. Who knows? Could be a Christian friend. Could be a non-Christian friend could be a very non-Christian friend. It could be somebody that you hardly even know, and, and you're thinking to yourself, why are you telling this to me? <laughs> you know, someone just opens up and shares something that they're going through. Again, that's our opportunity to talk to this real person with a real problem on a personal level. Or at the very least... To just be a good listener. (laughs) Somebody sharing something that's really personal. Oh, please, we mustn't just busy ourselves with other things. Sorry, I haven't got time for that. Oh, far be it from us to ever react like that. At least to just hear them. It could be that, you know, somebody sharing something about some, some strife at home, some marital conflict, or maybe it's financial pressure. Or a health scare. Or or maybe it's got something to do with gender confusion issues or parenting problems. Man, I don't know what I'm going to do with that teenager of mine. That kid is so rebellious. Driving me crazy. Or maybe it's a life-controlling addiction. Maybe somebody is struggling with feelings of loneliness or depression or 
you know, COVID-19 apprehension, whatever the list could go on and on, right? There's so many hurts and, and hardships and, and, and just different kinds of brokenness in that jungle out there. Have you discovered that? Come on, how many of you have had somebody open up to you with their personal problems? Let's see your hat. How many have had this happen numerous times? Let's, let's see both hands. It's very true to life. It's relevant stuff. Are we beginning to see the difference between the practical level and the personal level? You know, somebody says, what's for lunch? Or, honey, would you please make sure you get those leaves raked up before the snow comes? That's practical stuff, isn't it? A lot of practical stuff in real life. But when you dare to, to say to somebody, um... Are you okay? You, you seem quieter than usual. Or, is there something troubling? That's when you're getting across a line and you're getting a little bit personal, right? And that can be a really good thing. <laughs> I read about one young man. He was on his bicycle. He was hit by a car. And so they, they took him over to the hospital and started x-raying him, and they found out he had a fractured cheekbone and also a broken wrist, and so he's laying there, and they're working on him. And at one point, this nurse came in the room. She's got her clipboard. She's really pretty. And she asks a series of questions. You know, are you diabetic? You know, do you, do you have any history in your family of, of uh, heart condition or and and she's she's just going down her list you know do you do you do you, uh, do, you do you have any uh, any uh, blood pressure issues and and are, are you a person with any allergies that you know of and and so she goes all the way down her list and then she says well I think that's about all the questions I have but is there anything that you're aware of that would be important for us to know and and he said yeah there's one thing she's got her clipboard she's ready she said and what would that be he said I'm single Ah, yes. That would be the reason why your sweater is inside out, yes. You need a woman in your life. <laughs> Did you notice how in a not-so-subtle way he shifted the conversation from a medical level to a personal level? <laughs> I am an eligible bachelor. Life is so much richer when we graduate from the practical to the personal. Now, again, this morning, I want to hold up our fearless leader, Jesus, as the perfect example of our subject at hand. Have you noticed in the Scriptures that Jesus operates on a level of personal slash emotional? Have you seen that in the Word? You know, as you comb through the Scriptures, you're going to find time and time and time again where it uses this expression. It says, Jesus was moved with compassion. Have you noticed that? Let me give you a sampling. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Jesus saw that the people were harassed like sheep without a shepherd, and He was moved with compassion toward them. Matthew 14, 14, a crowd of sick people came to Jesus and he was moved with compassion and he healed them all. Matthew 15, verse 32, Jesus knew that the crowd were hungry and it says he was moved with compassion and, and then he proceeded to multiply the, the loaves and the fishes. Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, two blind men sought Jesus out and he was moved with compassion and he restored their sight. 2020. 20. Mark chapter 1, verse 41, a man with leprosy came to Jesus, and Jesus was moved with compassion, and he, he cleansed those men of that dreadful disease. Don't you just love Jesus? Mark chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus encountered a demon-possessed man, and the Bible says he was moved with compassion, and he set that guy free. The townspeople came out who, you know, they'd all been intimidated by this guy that was tormented by the devil. And they saw him and they couldn't believe it. They said, wow, he's fully dressed and in his right mind. <laughs> what a great description. Don't you want people to describe you that way? <laughs> in Luke chapter 7, verse 13, I love this one. Jesus interrupted a funeral procession. I love it when Jesus breaks with, you know, the protocol of social acceptability. You don't interrupt a funeral procession. Jesus did. 
In this case, it was, it was the only son of a widow that was the deceased. So she's already lost her husband, and now she's lost her son. And in the culture of that day, that would put a lady in a very tough spot. Jesus knew that. He stopped the, profession, the procession. He raised that boy back to life and presented him to his mom. <laughs> My heart is touched. It says he was moved with compassion. Or in the NIV, it says Jesus' heart went out to her. You see, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, We have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Yeah, he's touched with the feelings, the emotions of our hurts, all of our difficult stuff. That's our Jesus. Yeah, Jesus was very up close and personal with people, all kinds of people. Do you remember the time when Jesus, he had this encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Remember that? She came to draw water at the well, never met Jesus before. And, and Jesus comes up to her and he says, would you mind, could you spare me a cup of water? Now, if he had just left it at that, then it would have only been a conversation on a practical level, right? Cup of water, thank you very much, have a nice day. But Jesus didn't leave it at that. He said, ma'am, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for water, and I would give you living water. I would give you the eternal life juice. You never thirst again. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. We'll get to the spiritual level of relating to people later on in our series. But notice that Jesus also dared to raise this conversation from a practical level, just a cup of water. He raised it to a personal level. In fact, to the prophetic level. He said to her, I'd like to meet your husband. She said, well, I'm not married. I don't have a husband. He said, actually, ma'am, according to the statistics, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with right now is desperately trying to avoid being number six. She dropped her water bucket. You are a prophet. By the time the day was done, not only did she bring her boyfriend out to meet Jesus, she brought the rest of the town, and they all put their faith in him. Jesus isn't content with the practical. He wants to get personal. You know, every Sunday here at Gateway, we focus on one of the many aspects of what it means to be called a Christian, right? And so obviously, today it's compassion. Is that not one of the great aspects of what it means to genuinely follow Jesus? Compassion. Everybody say compassion. You see, when we make that personal decision to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior, you know, somebody helped us to understand our need of, of spiritual rebirth, and we get it that Adam and Eve got us all in trouble with that original sin, and, and then Jesus came to get us out of trouble when he died on that cross as a sacrificial lamb and took the blame for all of our sinfulness, all of our misguidedness, so that if we would simply put our faith in what he accomplished for us with his death and resurrection and said, Jesus, I get it. I need to be spiritually reborn. I need you as my Savior. Please come into my life and forgive me and help me to get on track to live a brand new life. That's called Christianity. And so when we make that personal decision to, to start following the Lord, wow, there's, there's all kinds of different ways that He wants to make a positive difference in our lives. And one of them is this one right here that we're talking about this morning. Jesus wants to replicate in you and I His compassion. You know, some people, even before they become a Christian, they're already kind of a compassionate, merciful individual. But now, in Christ, we can become compassionate in Jesus' name. There is a difference. Some, for some people, admittedly, before they became a Christian, they were definitely not a very compassionate person. You know, in our parable, two out of the three people that came down the road just went by and couldn't be bothered to stop and help. 
According to my math, that's about 66%. Now, I don't know what it would be in the general populace in 2020. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be one of the 66% that go by on the other side of the road and say, well, it's not my problem. It's not my family member. Why would I need to stop? But he got beat up too bad. What am I? A paramedic? No, a Christian. Yeah. I don't want to be one of the 66%. I want to be one of the 33% that readily responds to a person that is hurting. Man, you just missed a great chance to say amen. Come on, you can make up for it right now by saying this. Come on, everybody say, Christ in me. Is compassion. Yes. Not only that, but Jesus is also very perceptive. I guarantee there's going to be people around you that are troubled. Can you pick up on that? Love your neighbor on a personal, emotional level. You know, Dick Shepard and his wife were pastors. I, I believe it was in London, England years ago. And one Sunday morning, there was a young lady that came into their service. They'd never seen her before. And so afterwards, they met her, and, and they began to visit a little bit with her. And she began to tell her story. And wow, once she started, she could hardly, you know, stop. And she's just, she just pouring out all this emotion and all this information about how, you know, she lived out in a rural area. And, 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 and she had this big fight, this big argument with her mom and dad. And she ran away from home. And she, she came to the city. And, and, and she's going on and on about, you know, I'm going to be able to, to make something of my... I don't need my mom and dad. They don't understand me. And I'm going to find a place. And I'm going to find a job. And I'm going to get some new friends. And and I'm going to work this out. And she's going on and on like this. And the more she talked, the more Dick Shepard was hearing what she was not saying. This girl is homesick. And when she finally paused long enough to catch her breath, he said, he said, listen, would you like my wife and I to drive you back home to your parents' place? And she burst out in tears and she said, would you please? And so they did. Oh, my goodness. Folks, if you want to effectively relate to people on a personal level, there's a few things I think that we would do well to know. You might want to jot these down. Let me quickly give you four of them. The first one is this. If people are to confide in you on a personal level, it's a trust issue. There's something about you that they feel they can talk to you about their problems and they just know that you're not the kind of of person that will blab it all over town. Now, not always, but very often when a person in the workplace, when they need to pour their heart out to somebody, who do they go to? Not always, but often they go to the one that's a Christian in the office. Why? They trust you. They admire you. They respect you. They see the way you you live your life. See, that's why it's so important that we earn a reputation among non-believers around us. Co-workers, neighbors, whoever the people in our lives are. They need to see us. They need to know us as a Christian that is credible. It's about trust. They need to see you as the real deal Christian. And listen very carefully. Blessed is the parent who has such a good relationship and such good rapport with their kids when they're young so that when those kids get to be teenagers and now they're wrestling with some really serious issues, they've already developed a closeness with mom and dad so that when there's something going down that's not good, they will go to mom and dad and talk to them about it. Instead of going to everybody else except for mom and dad. Lord, help us. It's all about trust. All right, secondly, if we are to speak to someone on a personal level, who makes the first move? Well, the answer is most times the person with the hurt will open up to you. But sometimes you'll be the one that initiates this personal conversation. 
Some of you have heard me describe how years ago my friend Jerry Durston, he taught me the difference between asking how you're doing and how you're really doing. You know, how, how you doing? Well, that's just, that's just a greeting that we give one another, you know, at the beginning of the day. And we don't expect somebody to, you know, to, to give us an accurate rundown of how they're doing. We just expect a one-word answer. How are you doing? Fine. How are you doing? Good. And so we get on with our day. Right? It's, it, it's, it's, it's just practical. It's pleasant. It's not personal. But when we say to somebody, how are you really doing? It's just the insertion of that one little word. How are you really doing? Now that's getting personal. <laughs> Jerry and I had some really good talks. Five o'clock in the morning, I walk in the back door to start the day in the bakery. And he'd say, how you doing? i say, good, how you doing? Fine. I don't know, maybe he thought I was just a little bit too plastic, a little bit too, too together, a little bit too positive, maybe. But five minutes later, sometimes he would ask, how are you really doing? Oh, we had some good talks. Because neither of us wanted to be working in the bakery. Both of us had a heart to get back in ministry. <laughs> and now we both are. How are you really doing, he used to ask me. That can open things up, right? See, when you talk about money with somebody, wow, that's personal, isn't it? How many of you ever had somebody pour out their financial woes to you? One guy responded by asking a personal question. He said, well, okay, you got this financial pressure. Do you have any money in the bank? And the guy said, yeah. Yeah. Well, do you mind my asking, how much money do you have in the bank since you brought this up to me? How much do I have in the bank? Well, I don't know. I haven't shaken it lately. <laughs> one lady sensed that one of the other ladies in her workplace was troubled. So she very caringly said, are you okay? And the other lady said, yes, I'm okay. How about you mind your own business? But about 30 minutes later, that lady came back to her, and she apologized. I'm so sorry for talking to you that way. The fact is, I'm not okay. And she began to cry, and she said, can we talk? Yes, we can talk. <laughs> so most of the time, the person that is hurting, they're the ones that will knock on your door, but sometimes you're the one that will feel prompted to make the first move. I'm telling you, a little Holy Spirit boldness goes a long way. All right, quickly, number three. The third one is this, relax. You don't have to be a professional. See, some people are, are, are like, wow, all this talk about reaching out on a personal, emotional level. Pastor, I am not a counselor. I'm not a psychologist. Pastor, if, if somebody starts talking to me about their personal matters, I feel incredibly awkward. I don't know what to say. You might be surprised what wisdom and what encouragement might issue from your mouth especially when you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. There'll be times when you have to just, just retreat afterwards and say, wow, I didn't know that I knew that stuff that I told that person. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you can do this. You really can. Don't you quit on me now. Come on now. You were created with a soul, which is the, the mechanism in us that, that deals in the emotional. Every one of us, we've been wired with a tremendous capacity for forgiving and receiving emotion. God has intended to that to be very much a part of who we are as humanity. So if somebody starts to pour their heart out to you, don't you run and hide. You can do this. Sometimes you just need to be there. Just be there. Just listen. Just be a good listener. You can be an emotional good Samaritan. Come on, just turn to your neighbor right now and say, I can do all things through Christ. All right, fourthly and finally. When you engage someone on a personal level, you might need to involve a third party. 
I see that here in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He recruited the help of the innkeeper to pick up where he left off the following day, making sure that this man was properly attended to. Now, sometimes when a person is telling you their problems, as I said in our previous point, with the help of the Lord, you'd be amazed how helpful you can be. But there will be times when you feel kind of inadequate. And there might be another person's name that comes to your mind, and you might find yourself saying to a hurting person, I know somebody that I think would be really helpful for you to talk to. They've been exactly where you are right now. And you can hook them up. Or it might be that somebody shares something with you that's really pretty heavy, and you need to say to them, you have to go to the authorities about this. You have to. No, I can't do... You have to. Or you might say something like, you have got to go to the principal about this bully. You have to talk to your spouse about this. No, I can't. You have to. Yes, I know. I know I have to. I just needed to hear it from you. These are deeply personal conversation, sometimes you will need to draw from someone else as a resource to help so-and-so. I want to conclude this morning by referencing the experience of, of Steve Masterson. He spoke at one of our, our men's conferences, one of our, our Promise Keepers events a number of years ago, and I've never forgotten what he shared he talked about how he and his dad had a relationship that was anything but personal. He had never heard his dad say these words, son, I love you, or son, I'm proud of you. He just never had that kind of closeness with his dad. And now his dad was getting well up in years. And he said to his wife, I've got to talk to my dad heart to heart before he passes away. And so he booked a plane ticket. He flew to the city where his dad was living and he made arrangements to go and pick him up and take him for breakfast. And so they did that. And, and then he was driving his dad back to his dad's re res residence. And, and before he got out of the vehicle to go around and open the door and help his dad back to his place, he said, Dad, there's something I want to say to you. Dad, I love you. And Steve was hoping against hope that his dad would respond by saying, Son, I love you. That's, of course, what he was, was trying to draw, that emotional response from his dad in this heart-to-heart in this -heart father and son moment. That's exactly what Steve wanted to hear. And, and, and when he said, Dad, I love you, there was this awkward pause for a few seconds. And then his dad said, some of you have heard me share it before. Then his dad said, thanks for the breakfast. You understand, Steve was trying to, 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 to pull his dad up to a personal level of conversation. But his father defaulted back to a practical level. You know, bacon and eggs. Oh, brother. Mission not accomplished. Later on, sometime later, the mission was accomplished. But not that day. That day it was rather saddening. But listen to me, folks. Whether it be your father or a colleague at work or a friend or whoever it is, don't settle for life on the practical level. Meet people on an emotional level. It's not easy. Oh, sometimes it's really not easy to, to do that emotional level thing, but I'm telling you the payoff is way bigger than merely being content with life in the practical lane. I'm telling you there's a lot of people out there that are troubled. To be missional is to be emotional. Take that home with you. Tweet it to somebody you know. To be missional is to be emotional. Come on, would you stand with me? Practical is good. Personal is better. Please come with me. Next Sunday, we're going to an even more challenging level. 
Next week we're going to talk about what we talk about next week. Who are the people in your neighborhood? I assure you in the week ahead, you're going to have opportunity to speak with someone on a personal level. Please don't just walk by on the other side of the road. Come on, everybody say, Christ in me is compassion. Amen. Come on, let's make a, a decision before we leave church today. Let's make an intelligent decision to be intentional about being personal. Are you with me? Come on, we can do this in Jesus' name. Come on, as you stand before the Lord and just focus in on Him right now. Let's make a decision. Let's make a commitment. Lord, I refuse to be a part of the 66%. So help me, Jesus. I'm going to be a part of the 33%. I'm going to be a good Samaritan. I'm going to be a person who's heads up and picks up on the signals when people around me are, are demonstrating or even just stating it right out fact, factual that they're hurting. Lord, I'm going to pick up on that. I'm not going to run away from it. I'm going to respond to it. Come on, right where you stand in God's house this morning, just make a decision right now. So help me, Jesus. I am one of your agents operating on a level that is emotional and personal and helpful, merciful. May there be some really wonderful, really sweet, really powerful, even miraculous exchanges between us and others with whom we have to In the name of Jesus, we so commit to that. Come on, would you just remain in prayer for another moment? Because before I release you from this service, I want us all to pray together that simple prayer of faith. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, in this personal moment of commitment, quite possibly there's individuals here today who have never made that decision to say, Jesus, I need to invite you to come into my life and be my personal Savior. And I'm not leaving until I've done that. So if you know that you need to make Jesus your Savior and follow Him, just raise your hand wherever you are across the room. If you know you need the Lord, yes, I see your hand over here and back on my left. Thank you. You can put it down. Are there others? Who else? This is, this is a perfect moment to say, Jesus, so help me. I want to live my life following you. Anybody else? Just, just wave at me. Don't be held back by any kind of fear. Yes, I see your hand up front. Thank you. Anybody else? It's a great day in our life. And we say, Jesus, from here on out, it's you and me. It's you and me. Anybody else? Before we pray together, come on, church. Let's all pray this prayer and affirm and reaffirm our love for Christ. Let's pray this. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name, I receive your gift of salvation. Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. I believe you died on that cross. You rose from that grave to break the power of sin off my life and to give me a brand new start. Wash me with your blood. Forgive me for all I've ever done wrong. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live with your compassion. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give the Lord a hand, would you? Thanks for joining us today. As a church, our desire is that we always bring encouragement. So if today's message was encouraging to you, you can drop us a line and let us know. Or if you have any prayer requests, we'd love to hear from you. You can stay connected to what's happening at Gateway by subscribing right here or following our social media accounts. Hey, if you want to support our vision and help us keep moving church forward, there's two easy ways you can give. You can text to give or give online. That's all I got for you, so have a great week and we'll see you again next time.